Now, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy in America uh, with Lou Pugliarisi of ePrink. He's president of ePrink in Washington, D.C. And he joins us to talk about mm, national and international trends in energy. So, so nice to have you on the show, Lou. Good to be here, Jay. So uh, we're going to talk today about, um, about Joe Biden, about the appointments he's making and what that tells us uh, about the future of energy under his administration. Uh, and climate change under his administration. So we have a, you know, a, a pretty good smattering that's not complete yet, but we should be able to at least get a handle on what he's thinking. We, can, we should also talk about how much of that he can realize, Lou, because it's still in play, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, we live in a political town here in Washington and uh, we have a, a lot of policy matters which are based on substantive a lot of political concerns. And I thought what we would do tonight or this afternoon is, is talk a little bit about what the existing appointments tell us about where President-elect Biden is going, what the lack of appointments we've heard so far at some of the other uh, critical agencies to energy and climate also tell us, and see if we can put a framework on where, where, what we're likely to see and what we're likely to accomplish uh, in depending upon your point of view, and we'll dig into all of this a bit. So good. And so let's. We have one. I think we have one picture today. We can put that up on the board. Yeah. So I think that you know the first thing to talk a little bit about presidential transitions, and most administrations, they usually leak like a sieve. The interesting thing. The only time. Uh, these administrations seem to do a good job is in the transition. Everyone's afraid if they open their mouth, they'll lose their job. So people pay attention to the rules. They don't leak information. They say they don't know anything and they wait for the big guy to make the decisions. And so far, what we, we, so, so we have a lot of what we call message discipline going on now. But, and the interesting thing is we don't, we have some information on what's going on. But uh, we only have one directly relevant energy pick, and that's the well-known windsurfer and husband of uh, the Heinz Foundation uh, heiress, uh, John Kerry. And he's the special envoy designate for cl climate. Some people might, you know, he used to be Secretary of State, but I think he now will be calling himself Secretary of the World. Okay, because you know, <laughs> is this a new job, Lou? This is a brand new job. Of course, presidents had the ability to appoint these czars, give them very lofty, um, you know, titles, let them sit in on cabinet meetings. But he will not be an official member of the cabinet. He can, at the discretion of the president, sit in as a member of the National Security Council along with the power ministries. So he's given a lot of status, right? But uh, we're gonna get into a little bit more. But still unknown, and we'll talk a little bit, is uh, who the climate energy czar is going to be because we need a climate energy czar as long as the world energy czar. We don't know who the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, although Mary Nichols, the current head of the California Air Resources Board, uh, uh, a young woman in her mid seventies, uh, <laughs> we don't know who the administrator of uh, EPA is going to be. I mean, we don't know Mary Nichols, as I said. We don't know who the energy secretary, but there are several good candidates out there, including the former secretary of energy, Ernie Moniz, a sort of really brilliant physicist. Uh, we don't know who the secretary of interior is, but uh, former Senator Udall appears to be campaigning for the job issuing press releases on his great uh, climate work. And we don't know uh, who the head of the Council of Environmental Quality is going to be, but we'll know more later. And I think the other thing is where we get into some of these uh, candidates here and what they mean, and you, you can stop me whenever you want, is that I'm pretty sure we're going to have a divided Congress. That is, um, we're going to have uh, require the Republic, I would, I would bet not a lot of money, but a, a good portion of money that the 
Republicans will pick up at least one of the two seats in the Georgia runoff election. One will be enough to give them control of the Senate and for Mitch McConnell to remain as majority leader. Now, let me, but let me uh, ask a question at this yeah. point. Just waiting for my opportunity. Can we put that chart back up on the on the wall? Uh, yeah. How many of these people um, require a Senate consent? All of them? No. No, only three of them. I'm pretty sure, possibly the director of national economics. Clearly, Kerry does not require, but Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, and the director of OMB, Nira Nadi, who has said some very unpleasant things about certain members of the Republican Senate. Mm -hmm. So whether they will ask her to apologize, I don't know. But she, she's going to have a rough road in her confirmation process. I'm pretty sure Anthony Blinken, Janet Yellen, Brian Deese will sail right through. And I'm almost sure he, Brian Deese is a direct uh, appointment by the president. Doesn't require confirmation. Well, you say sail right through, but um, you know th th we live in new times. And, yes, that, uh, in fact, let me tell you a story. Yeah, that's worth talking about. The Secretary of Transportation, uh, Elizabeth Chu, right, is the wife of the Majority Leader um, McConnell. McConnell. She used to be, she previously served as labor secretary. She has an impeccable record. But under pressure from the progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party, particularly Schumer felt a lot of pressure. And he literally tortured that nomination and strung it along for a long, long time. She was kept, uh, and you know, this is quite, uh, in my view, this is, it's not only that she was a very well-established and middle-of-the-road kind of candidate for Secretary of Transportation. She had been confirmed as Secretary of Labor. She was the wife of the majority leader. So one can only imagine that there might be some residual resentment uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate and that some of these appointments may get uh, may get uh, tortured through the process. It's Why not the all of them? Why not? We, know, we, are, we are at war between the Republicans and the Democrats. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure. First, I think this, the so-called power ministries will get approved quickly. They're not outside the mainstream. Uh, there may be some concern over the defense pick, uh, General Austin, but I think that's more because he is a uh, former uh, retired uh, army uh, general of the army, and we we need a waiver to have a former general be defense. And a lot of Democrats don't like that. They want a some they want a civilian control of the Defense Department. I'm pretty sure Anthony Blinken is will go through Secretary of State. I don't I don't see a big problem. That's my political. Okay. I, well, I, let me just add my point that I uh, started making before. And that is that uh, if, if this is war um, at, or a continuation of, the, of the, the war with the Republicans, by the Republicans, um, they're not going to, they're going to delay everything. Merritt Garland, you know, was a good example of how you can delay, never bring it to the floor, never do anything. Uh, leaving the president uh, who wants to appoint these people uh, swinging. And, and I just wonder, maybe you know the answer. Uh, suppose he can't get his cabinet through. Well, actually, Trump, he says he Trump, has a lot of, Trump has a lot of experience with this. This is exactly, Trump was the most um, penalized presidential uh, president uh, in terms of his holding up his cabinet appointments. Now, I don't want to get into you know, what, what the specifics... No, I'm, of, I'm just talking the reality. The reality, the reality is that... The reality is that I, I, I will hope that the Republicans will say, look, it's time to put an end to this stuff. Uh, there's a few of these candidates that... Do you have any indication of that? Because right now, they're, they're, all, they're all solid like a rock. Um, and they're not even admitting that Biden won the election, most of them. I, I don't see that as a problem. That, that's that's going to... Biden will become president on January 20th. 
and the Republicans will recognize that he won. This just has to do with the Georgia election and uh, figuring out, remember, remember, this, the interesting thing about this is on January 21st, Trump is the front runner <laughs> for the 2024 election in terms of the Republican primary. Now, whether he would actually run in 2024, I don't know. But in any kind of objective analysis, he's the front runner. <laughs> you so, know, years, uh, ago, I, years ago, I was a member of the Republican Party. <laughs> to me, he's the front runner. He's the captain of the head, as he used to say in the Naval Services. <laughs> so, so let's go on. So I do think so. I sort of want to focus this a little bit more on energy and climate, but we can get back to the politics. Uh, so if you have divided government, there's those things uh, Biden can do on a regulatory side that can make a difference. And even there, he has to follow the law. It's not so easy to turn around a lot of these uh, regulatory programs. And it's not easy to do programs which cost a lot of money. So he's gonna have to figure a way to navigate with a divided uh, government. Now that's good and bad news for Biden. Biden is not a radical progressive. In my mind, he's an old fashioned Democrat. And he doesn't really like this stuff. Defund the police, uh, have everyone eat mung beans and drive their bike to work. He's not for that stuff. Well, and the whole uh, new green deal um, you know, creates a problem. That what, I, what I am concerned about, I, I meant to say this too before yeah. we, began the show is that here's a guy in a, you know, whether he seems like it or not, he's in a fragile position. He's got to get his act together. He's got to deal with all these onslaughts of insults and ridiculous lawsuits and so forth and failure of transition. And, and um, so he's got, he's got a lot of issues on his plate. And now he's got some of the um, sort of the left, left-hand side of the Democratic Party saying his his appointments aren't so good and his policies aren't so good and they want more representation among his appointees and it's already a squabble. Yeah, and I'm course. saying this is the wrong time for a squabble. Right. Uh, there ought, ought to be solidarity, don't you think? Wouldn't that be right, better for the he, country? He can, at some point he's going to have his, he's going to have to have his sister soldier moment with the far left. He's just going to have to point out to them that their strategy is a loser for everybody. But, I don't know when that's going to happen. On the other hand, as we were talking before the burger, he probably secretly in his room at night prays for a Republican Senate so he doesn't have to do a lot of these crazy things. I don't think he believes in a lot of these crazy things. Well, the problem things. is he may not be able to do anything. Uh, that's not true. That's, that's like a, a suicidal <laughs> wish. And by the way, he has two in my view, although climate is a huge feature, right out of the box. He has two major uh, legacy you know, requirements as a probably a one-term president. One, get this COVID thing under control. Right? I mean, people like me who live in energy and environment, we think that's the world. That is not the world. The world are two things from Biden's point of view. In my, one, he's got to get this COVID under control. He's going to put a huge amount of his political capital into that. Two, he is going to be spending an enormous effort in building back American alliances around the world. Those, in my mind, are the two main issues he's going to focus on for the first two years. Yes, climate is going to be a big feature, a big concern, but he's going to be limited by a divided Congress, and uh, all uh, and uh, budget problems. We have huge budget problems. So, so I oh, think going back to the uh, the point about building alliances, you know, Kerry, uh, the creation of Kerry's job and Kerry's appointment is probably you know pretty smart because it it doesn't because it doesn't require the consent of the Senate because he can send Kerry out there uh, to negotiate or renegotiate these uh, relationships through the lens of climate and environment. Um, you know, for example, you know, the Paris Accord is largely a, a diplomatic affair. 
Um, and and the, the two are inextricably intertwined. That is building our relationships back and also entering the climate uh, the climate accord. Right, and, I think and, and, and Kerry is the guy at the point of that. You know, it's just practical uh, well, what's going to happen. You're going to see conflict between Kerry and Jake and the National Security Council and the State Department. And here's why I believe that. I believe that these are traditional security oriented Democrats. I mean, they they have a lot of experience out of the Obama administration, but I don't believe if Kerry came to them and said, look, we need to give the Chinese a pass on line nine and uh, Tibet and everything because they're going to sign up for the climate accord. Those guys are not gonna go for that. They're gonna say no. The security comes first, then comes climate. So I think that's where there's going to be a conflict because the Chinese are very smart. They're going to say, look, they've already announced we're going to go to net zero. It's kumbaya. All, let's all get together. It's going to be fine. And then someone's going to raise their hand in one of the power ministries and say, well, what about line nine and uh, the uh, uh, human rights of the Uyghurs or the uh, destruction of democratic rights in Hong Kong. What about all that stuff? Oh, do we not care about that anymore? So I, I see that that's going to be, that's something we need to watch. It's going to be very fascinating to see how they square that circle. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I, I there's I a, there's a lot of issues and they're all, they're all intertwined. They all touch each other. It's a, it's a complicated ecology right now. Yeah, and I do think that we have to remember Biden did announce or in the campaign had three basic goals. One, we're going to change the fuel mix in the transportation sector and we're going to radically reduce our use of fossil fuels, gasoline, diesel fuels for electrons, batteries, electricity, you know, electric vehicles. We're going to do a massive program on that. Um, we're going to uh, head to net zero. Uh, we're going to get the grid to net zero by 2035 and the whole country to net zero by 2050. By the way, I believe that's an impossible task. I believe they have no idea of the dominance of fossil fuels and how hard and a heavy a lift it is to do that kind of transformation, even in 30 years. You know, you know, yeah, I, I agree. It's I, I very just, hard to reach those targets. Yeah, we, we had a program. The only kind of government uh, that is that, capable of yeah. reaching those targets is, is a, okay. it's an absolute government like China. So he's going to hit, he may, so we may say, you know, Biden's going to hit the ground running, but it might be an uphill climb on a rocky path. That's all I want to say. <laughs> well, let's talk about his appointment of uh, EPA and uh, energy. What, what's the problem about making those? Why, why hasn't he named anybody? Is this a, well, I, I a politically they, dangerous uh, set of appointments? I, I don't, I think they are. I mean, I think that uh, there's a couple of other themes I think he's working through. I think one is that, you know, he's an old union guy. He believes in labor. And if you look at uh, his uh, secretary of treasurer, uh, the Council of Economic uh, chair uh, uh, designates Cecilia Rouse and uh, the members. All of that, I think you're going to see a lot of emphasis in structural inequality, even environmental justice. So I think the social justice and environmental justice that poor people are more subject to environmental degradation, these are going to be major themes. So, so when we get, so I think he really hasn't really worked out the politics of those other appointments yet. I, I'm pretty sure as somebody in mind, and he's also balancing this identity politics with the substantive issues he's interested in. So, and I think we can look I, I, But what about backlash? You know, if you appoint the wrong person, um, you get backlash. If you uh, just, I'm making this up, but if you appoint somebody who's, who's too far left and has all these progressive ideas, then the right is going to oppose it. And, and if, if uh, Mitch McConnell is in charge of the Senate. That's a big problem. Um, if if you come too far, well, Mitch McConnell will be in charge. Of if you if you come too far right, uh, then the left side of the Democratic Party is going to oppose it. I mean, he's he's walking he's walking a very narrow channel here. 
and it's easy to make a mistake. Yeah, and I think you know he. It's not like he hasn't been around. So uh, it's hard for me to think that he doesn't know what the dangers are, and that he's not. And he does have a relationship with Mitch McConnell, and I suspect he will use that. Now let's see what comes of that. But how much compromise are both sides willing to make? And so would you would you advise him? to wait until after, say, January 5th and the runoff, uh, runoff elect elections in Georgia before making decisions on these environmental and energy uh, you know, posts? So my guess is he doesn't need to wait till January 5th, because even if the Democrats were going to win both of those, and technically they have a tiebreaker with Kamala Harris, the nature of the Senate is that you don't win too many things by 51 to 50. You've got a uh, moderate Democrat. I mean, there's a couple of themes out there. And you know, you like, they're really down on Rahm Emanuel who's being considered for, I don't know, transportation or something. I don't know what, but he's a very hardball and hard headed thinking politician. And you look at what happened in the last election. Right? They were supposed to control the Senate they literally, they put hundreds of millions of dollars in candidates and they lost, right? They put $140 million to go after Lindsey Graham. They, lost, they were supposed to gain seats in the house and they lost at least 10 seats, almost all of them to minorities and Republican women. So, and the house is at extreme risk of going Republican in 2022. It's very common for presidents to lose a lot of seats in the first term presidents in the midterm. And the trend in the house is very, so B Biden's not stupid. He's been in- Well, you know, he said he was not going to appoint uh, uh, sitting members of, of, of Congress to these jobs because he wanted to preserve the democratic majority uh, in, uh, in the house, but well, then yeah. he appointed two of them already. Who was he appointed? Two, two uh, in the last couple of days. Fudge was one of them. I don't remember the other one. Oh yeah, maybe out of the House, but he's not going to appoint anybody out of the Senate. No, that, that would that would be crazy. The House is not that important. Yeah, they well, know. The majority probably, in the House is is thin, also, you know. It is, but they you know probably if he appoints them from a safe district, they can win in a you know in a special election. That'll be okay. The House problem is more the whole, when the whole House runs in two years. That, mm -hmm. That's his problem. And he's got to know, looking at history, that that's at a huge, he's a huge risk of losing the House. Huge. So I guess, you know, when you say that his appointments reflect <clears throat> the future of energy and climate in this country, and uh, certainly they do. That. I'm saying they reflect what he's trying to do. Yeah, okay. All right, people. what he's trying to do. And I guess it's, it's, there's so many questions built into that. Yeah. One is, can he get can he get his initiatives through? Um, two is, you know, is he right? Uh, and what will ultimately be his decisions about these things? Because he's got he's in a minefield of of you know so various well, contentions. So we could take a look at each one of these appointments quickly here. For Kerry, I think he may want him to play more of a role in export relevant discussions with the European Union, right? Maybe methane strategy, car, carbon border adjustment mechanism, these kinds of things. For example, if the EU, what are the problems with individual countries undertaking a climate initiative, which affects the structure of their economy? They can penalize certain industries, which will not be competitive, and then imports could flow in to substitute for those. It could be steel, it could be, it could be anything. And so you need some kind of border adjustment. And that's what the European Union is pushing now. They said, look, if you want to ship LNG to Europe, you have to that LNG meets a certain, from the production of the gas to the liquefaction of the gas to the shipment of the gas, that it is meeting certain standards. If it's not, we're not going to let it in or we're going to penalize it some way. So that's going to be, I think Kerry's going to be wrapped up a lot in that kind of stuff, those kinds of negotiations. 
uh, carbon border. Then uh, the other question is, we have something called the US Development Finance Corporation, which has been very involved in supporting uh, LNG projects, some fossil fuel power systems, mostly natural gas around the world. So what, you know, are they gonna step in and stop that kind of thing? I just don't, I, I find that that may be hard. Um, I think when you get to Secretary of State, I'm Anthony Blinken, I'm sure he's going to be actually relatively hawkish on Venezuela, an oil producer, and Iran, also an oil producer. Uh, although he worked on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the Post and the Times about them re-engaging with the Iranians. That's a long road. Yeah. Oh, they've said as much. Yeah, yeah. So we and actually we don't know yet how Kerry is going to interact with the rest of the agencies, which have very standard kinds of responsibilities. Um, I think the interesting to watch is this uh, uh, Nira Tandon. She has been nominated to be the head of the Office of Management and Budget. She's the head of the Center for American Progress, a, a left-leaning think tank uh, that has uh, reportedly received donations from fossil fuel companies. So she's going to get some attack on the left, but uh, she, you know, I, I think uh, she's likely to, to be very active in this social cost of carbon debate. That's kind of an inside baseball issue, but uh, within the US, but social cost of carbon and calculating carbon emissions and cost benefit analysis and approving projects was a very big deal in the Obama administration and it was largely repealed by Trump. And that's the question of how should you, if I'm developing an oil and gas project or getting approval for a pipeline, how should I account for the carbon emissions when, when the government decides it should should there be some calculation of a, of a damage function from that? And so that's going to be, that so much as a kind of very inside the beltway fight, that's going to be very active in the next Well, she, she may not get to first base on that. If there's one of his uh, uh, appointments that is, is looking for trouble, it's her. <clears throat> and you can expect a big fight about it. I expect her to be one of the toughest nominations out there. Yeah. I mean, at least in the energy environment. Yeah. What is, but what does that mean, though, in terms of the ultimate policy? Actually, the ultimate policy is going to be largely regulatory initiatives, uh, mostly in the power sector. There may be other issues in which you could uh, accelerate research for batteries and R&D and cooperative R&D, there is not going to be substantial movement in costly measures for energy transformation in the next four years. There's just not going to be that. There's just no consent. That takes a consensus. If you're going to impose large costs on the American people, you need a consensus. You, you well, I'd I like to throw something at you. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think there'll be arguments about it, but the one, you know, uh, Biden has to initially, he has to fix the things that got broken during the Trump administration, um, you know, which were often for bad reasons or no reasons except personal reasons. I mean, it, you know, it's just perfect where right now the Trump administration is going after Facebook, and the reason is that Facebook made warnings about his remarks over the election. And it's, it's clear that it's not a matter of policy, it's just a matter of his personal view of things and he's using, using the whole government as a way to get even, which is really despicable. Um, but there's a lot of things that he's done for the wrong reasons and Biden is gonna have to address those things. So I would it's gonna take him a while to reverse those things and he really can't get to you know, taking new initiatives in a direction he would like to see until he deals with the problems that Trump has left him. It'll take a while. So wait, I, but I, I would be careful because I think there are plenty of people on the left who also think these technology companies have too much power. So
so I would I would be cautious saying that there isn't a left right nexus to kind of rein these guys in a bit. Each group has a different view of what the problem is. So, but it's I wouldn't not, disagree with that. Uh, I think they like, should be reined in. The, the problem is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a lot of the things that he has done uh, are personal, and they are not based on policy or considerations or the benefit of the country, um, you know, or good American interests in general. They're just stuff that he has come up with. I, I remember he went after uh, TikTok because they fouled up his uh, appearance in uh, Tulsa. Remember that? And it, it had nothing to do with whether TikTok was good or bad, or even the China connection. It was because he was he oh, was that, ticked off at TikTok. TikTok. So we, we can't afford that. And I think under Biden, we're not going to have that. You know, if I you want to look for a distinction, that would be one major distinction. I, I would argue that that's absolutely correct. We're going to have something what we used to call regular order. In other words, we will have substantive reasons. We will probably do something to TikTok, but have nothing to do with making Trump look bad. You know, just it's because TikTok represents cer certain security concerns that the intelligence agencies are quite nervous about. But we're going to have. I, I think this will be the positive, what I consider very positive aspect. Trump was a very chaotic leader in this sense. I mean, to say the least. Can we quote you on that, Lou? Yeah, you can quote him. <laughs> and that with Biden, you're going to get. I'm not saying you're. I'm not saying that yeah, people on the left or conservative people. You might consider me slightly right of center. You're not going to see people like me uh, necessarily agree with everything Biden does. But I think it's going to be a substantive fight. It's going to be okay. This is what we want to do. Is they're going to make the case for it, and it's not going to be personal. It's going to be policy. It could still be wrong. Well, you know, I you know I agree with you, and I think that from the Biden side of this and his appointments, you know, which are the subject of our discussion, we're going to see policy policy people doing policy. It's not going to be personal. It's not going to be political. It'll just be policy. On the other hand. And maybe this is something you and I should follow in downline shows, particularly about energy. We have to look at the Republican side too. And if you take a page out of Mitch McConnell's book and the Republicans look how tight they are, even in, in, you know, in this crisis right now, um, there's a fair chance they're gonna continue the same kind of thing that Trump was doing and that McConnell was doing. And they're not gonna be looking for policy as befits the country. They're going to be looking for policy as befits the politics. And that is really tragic. And if you ask me which side, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans are more likely to do that, clearly it's the Republicans. Well, I, I'm not going to defend the Republicans on this, but Nancy Pelosi sat on a $1.8 trillion uh, package for COVID. She's now saying that Biden has won the election she can agree to 800 billion. So she had 1.8 billion in the bag, but it wasn't enough. So the both sides have their, they're up to their necks in politics. They're not, I mean, I would be cautious about, don't fall in love with either of these guys, okay? <laughs> I do think the benefit of Biden, as I said, is we're going to get regular order. That's actually worth a lot. But politics never goes away. That's the nature of uh, Washington. I mean, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Lou. One thing is one thing is clear. We're going to have this conversation again, and we're going to have it with the you know indubitable benefit of seeing it unfold now and in the future exactly. after inauguration day, and and we will we will ask this very question again and see who's doing what and why and the benefit to the country, and of course, the benefit to our energy policy. Anyway, uh, on uh, this coming uh, Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to be doing a very large open webinar on the future of LNG in Asia. So I'll send you a link. I'd be happy to share the invitation with anybody. Okay, great. We, we need to know about that. We need to follow that. Yeah. And that is, in, in, you know, uh, 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 totally related to our foreign policy in Asia.
Exactly. Uh, so we, we need to look at it because that's the future. Thank you so much, Lou. So nice to have you Good and to be see here. you and talk to you and have these discussions with you I in these so. very difficult times. And I hope to see you in person one of these days. Okay. Looking forward to that. Oh, Aloha. <laughs>